Now, this morning, I want you to take your Bibles and open to 2 Kings chapter 2. I know we've been doing a study in Mark, but I want to preach a different sermon today because I think it's right. Uh, If you're visiting here with us, we here at Grace, we are kind of in a little bit of a morning, maybe not a little bit, more like a lot of morning. We are, we're we're saddened today because last Sunday, about three o'clock, the angels came and took our founding pastors home to heaven. And uh, he was the pastor here, if you're visiting again, uh, he was a pastor here for over 43 years and taught us the word of God. He taught us the gospel. And so for all of us, this is going to be something that we're dealing with. We need the grace of God, don't we, to deal with all of this. And I, I thought it would, I needed a message that was a little bit different today. Um, and I asked the Lord for something, and I, I hope that this will be something that will be an encouragement to us all, uh, that we're going to move on for the Lord Jesus. We're prepared to do that. Um, Look at 2 Kings chapter 2 and look at verse number 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Theodore Roosevelt was an unforgettable historical figure. This is what one man wrote of him. He was so full of gusto and gumption of dynamism and vigor that one could get tired just reading all about him. On October 14, 1912, he was supposed to deliver a speech in Milwaukee. As he was getting out of his car to leave to go to the auditorium, a man came up and shot him in the chest. Roosevelt's doctors pleaded with him to go to the hospital, but he was headed for the auditorium, and he insisted that that's where he was going. Upon arrival, he told the people he'd been shot, and he asked them to be quiet and to excuse him that day. He wasn't going to be able to make a real long speech. But then he pulled out a blood-soaked manuscript from his coat pocket and proceeded to speak for 90 minutes. Years later, when uh, T.R. died in 1919, his sons, who were serving in the military in Europe at that time, received a cable, and it simply said this, the lion is dead. And one writer said this, and with his death was the passing of an era. And, you know, I think that we can relate to that, can't we? I think there's a sense in which we feel that same thing. Um, Pastor Johnson was a man that had that same kind of spirit, that same kind of dynamism, that vigor for life. And with his passing, there's a sense in which we feel like that it's the passing of an era. And that certainly seems to be the situation here in 2 Kings chapter 2, which I thought it would be good to look at this because we're not the first people to go through something like this. There's others that have gone through this this same kind of thing to watch the home going of a man of God. And this is the mood of 2 Kings chapter 2. This is the story of God calling home his servant, Elijah. And the life of Elijah, if you ever read it in the Bible, it was a whirlwind of activity to the time he stepped out of nowhere to confront King Ahab, to the Mount Carmel experience where he confronted all the prophets of Baal, to the times when he prayed that it would not rain and it did not, to his running in the desert and being fed by God, his life was tempestuous to say the least. And that life here is about to end in 2 Kings chapter 2. And as we come to a a passage like this, we ask ourselves the question, How should we respond when God takes home his servant? And this story about Elijah, I think in a way, kind of helps us to answer that. It kind of helps us to deal with that. You know, Elijah wasn't just any other prophet. He was a very unique prophet. Uh, He was bold. He was courageous. He called the people of God back to the true worship of the living God. He confronted Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. And when he passed into heaven, Elisha, when he lamented, he said this, the chariot of God and of Israel and the horsemen thereof. What did Elisha mean by that? And what he meant by that was simply that one man of God is better than a whole army. One man fully surrendered to God. Uh, His words are more effective in battling evil and battling the forces of sin and Satan than an army. Men of God are like that, because men of God teach us to trust in the Lord. That's why they're so very valuable. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. 
And that's what they teach us. And I can truly say that of Pastor Johnson. He was a warrior for God. He was used to teach us to trust fully in the Lord. But what we learn from this story is that men of God, however great they are, do not stick around forever. They are a gift from God that God gives us for a time, and then God calls them home. Even the choices of God's servants are taken from us. And when that happens, how are we to respond? You know, sometimes people, if we're not careful, can respond negatively to that in a negative way and not in faith. It reveals that some people are looking too much to man and not to the God of that man. And we certainly don't want to do that. But the main idea that we have here in this chapter, chapter 2, is that when God's leader is removed, everything of God remains. When God's leader is removed, everything of God remains. So with that in mind, I want you to see from this narrative just three responses we should have that are good responses to the taking of God's servant. If you're taking those, just write down number one, remember God's preparation. Remember God's preparation. Because before God takes his servants, he normally will prepare his people. And I can look and I can say, you know, certainly God has done that with us. This is what God did here in the time of Elijah. Uh, He graciously prepares those around before he takes his faithful servant home. And this is what happens. Now, first of all, he prepares a successor. If we look at the story here, uh, Elijah already knew that Elisha was there, that God had called him out to follow after Elisha. And actually, we see that in 1 Kings chapter 19. We don't have time to turn there, but you might remember that story. This was after Elijah was in the desert, and uh, he, he said to God, I'm the only one. There's All these people are bowing their knee to Baal, and I'm the only one. And God said, no, you're not. There are other people that I have raised up that you don't know about. And in fact, I want you to go and anoint Elisha because he's going to help you and he's going to uh, p- pick up the mantle when you are done. And so it's in 1 Kings 19.19, 19, Elijah cast his mantle on Elisha. God has servants ready to step up even when we don't even know about it. There are servants all over that God has ready to step up. Pastor Johnson was faithful in saying God's workmen die, but God's work goes on. God's work must go on. He prepares a successor. He prepares other leaders. We're going to find out as you read here in this chapter that there was a school of prophets. These were young men that were being trained. You know, Elijah knew that God was going to take them, but he didn't sit around and do nothing. You know what this story reveals? That he went from one of these school of the prophets to another to another. He just went around visiting these school of the prophets. Uh, In fact, look in verse 2, and Elijah said to Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. In fact, we'll see here in this chapter that he visits three prophetic schools, and no doubt when he goes there, he ministers to these students. Now, who are the sons of the prophets? Well, the Bible indicates that there were several schools of the prophets. Some of them were opened up in the time of Samuel and some in the time of Elijah and Elisha. And this was a place where people were being trained to do the work of God. Elijah was their leader. They were devoted to him. They were loyal to him. They invested, uh, Elijah invested in their life and training them. And Bethel was just one of those schools. There was also one in Jericho, and there was one by Jordan. And so under Elijah's ministry, many other leaders were trained, and they were prepared. God was preparing leaders. You know, I thank God because I believe that it's so very true of Pastor Johnson. He, He trained leaders. He taught us the Word of God. He prepared leaders to do the work of God. That's why I feel incredibly blessed with the staff that we have here at our church because they're devoted to God's work. And it gives me a lot of comfort and a lot of confidence to know that we are going to be working together as a team as we go forward in the work of the Lord. These are people that Pastor Johnson trained. And I also got to tell you, uh, church, that I am so blessed with our deacons. And I got to tell you that when I'm together in deacons meetings, um, I, I just feel so much support from them. I feel so much 
unity and love there. These are men that are prayerful men. They love God. They love the church. They want what's best for the church. And so I, I just look forward to the deacons' meetings. Now, I've pastored churches where I couldn't really say that. I couldn't say I look forward to the deacons' meetings. In fact, the opposite was true. But the, it's different here. It, you know why? Because these men were so very well trained. God has blessed us with fine men. And so God has prepared us. He's prepared leaders. But also he prepares the hearts of the people. This whole narrative is organized around a journey. And we see this in verse 1. Uh, Elijah and Elijah, they begin at a place called Gilgal. And then they travel in verse 2 to Bethel. And then from Bethel in verse 4, they travel to Jericho. And then from Jericho, uh, they, they go to Jordan. That's in verse number 6. And so Elijah was making this journey, and he was doing it under the direction of God. In fact, each time he moves on, this is what he says, the Lord has sent me. The Lord has sent me. Each time he says that. So the question is, why does God cause him to make this tour? What was God doing? And I think God was preparing the hearts of people because he was going to take his prophet. And I think at the same time, he was testing the hearts of the people. This was a test of loyalty. One thing you'll notice in this narrative is that each time Elijah is going to go to another place, he kind of makes an effort to deter Elisha. He says, well, you know, you wait here, and I'm going to move on. Just tarry here, I'm going to move on. Look, at, look in verse 2, and Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth, and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And again in verse number 4, and Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came down to Jericho. So each time Elijah says, you know, uh, Elijah says, you know, Elijah, you don't have to go. You just stay here. It's a long journey. It was 15 miles from Gilgal to Bethel, and then 15 miles from Bethel to Jordan, and then five miles from, or to Jericho, and then from, and five miles from Jericho down to Jordan. That's 35 miles of walking. I might have been tempted to say, okay, I'll just wait here for you. But Elisha says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm not leaving. And, and, and what you notice here is that Elijah's efforts seemed to be half-hearted. It was almost like he was testing him. You know, you don't have to go with me on this trip. You ever have someone do that? They really want you to go. But they're saying, ah, oh, you know, you, you can stay here. You don't have, it was kind of half-hearted. And I think what's going on here is that Elijah is testing Elisha's loyalty. And Elisha responds the right way. I am not staying here. I'm going with you. I'm staying with you. In other words, Elisha was saying, I refuse to be separated from you, Elijah. I don't want to be away from you. Even though it's the end of your ministry, I don't want to be separated from you. And let me just say that you as a congregation here at Grace, you are to be commended for your loyalty to the founding pastor of this church, Pastor Johnson. You're to be commended because of your love to to him and his family right up to the very last minute. And indeed, that love continues. And I say to Mrs. Johnson and the family, we're going to continue to take care of you and continue to love you because you're such a part of this ministry here. I am so glad that you all have showed that and that we were together with Pastor Johnson when God took him. I'm so glad that he wasn't somewhere else. So glad that he wasn't in some other place living but that he was with us here. You know, most of the time when a senior pastor steps down out of the role of senior pastor, sometimes some churches want that pastor to move on. Some churches would say, you know, it would kind of be hard for you to stay here, so why don't you just move on? We don't really want you here. Maybe in some places that is necessary, but not here. Not here. I'm glad that we had pastor here with us. I'm so glad that he was here to the final day. You know, when, when pastor stepped down of the role of senior pastor, and he came to my office and he said, you know, uh, what do I do now? How do I fit in? And I said, pastor, just keep on doing what you're doing. Just keep on loving this church. Keep on ministering to people. 
Keep on loving people. You don't need to ask permission to do anything. You know, if you want to go visit someone, go visit them. If you want to go see them in the hospital, go see them in the hospital. Whatever you want to do, you just do it. And you know what? He continued to minister. He continued to love the people of God. Just think if he wasn't with us, think of the blessings we would have missed out on. Even his very presence among us was encouraging. And so when I read this passage, I am just doubly blessed because I think this is the way the Lord would have it. That we were with him right up until the very day that the Lord took him to heaven. What a blessing that is. It was a test of loyalty. But I think also it was a test of nostalgia. Another thing that I notice about this journey that uh, Elijah and Elijah were on is that they, in each place they visited the sons of the prophets, and these sons of the prophets would approach Elisha, and they would say, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master? Each time that would happen. In fact, look in verse number 3. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And look at verse number five. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elijah's response was always the same. Yes, I know it. Be quiet. I don't want to talk about it. In a sense, that's what he was saying. Elijah didn't want to discuss the matter because it wasn't going to really change anything, and it would only intensify Elisha's grief at the prospect of Elijah going home. He didn't want to lose control of his emotions, so he said, I just don't want to really talk about it. Yes, I know. God has revealed it to me, just as he's revealed it to you. But here's the point. God had revealed it to those around. God was letting everyone know that I'm about to take my servant home. I'm about to take him, and you need to get ready for that. He was preparing hearts. I think God is gracious in the way that he dealt with these prophets in doing that, and I could say the same in our circumstance here. We all had the sense that the Lord was ready to take his servant home, and he was giving us time. He was preparing us for that. He was allowing us to get our hearts ready for that, and in their heart, they needed to let go of Elijah. They needed to process all of that. Leaders are called to serve in the present by moving forward into the future, but the way they deal with the past will determine whether the past is a rudder or isn't an anchor. You see, we can't let the past hold us back from going forward. The past can't be an anchor that holds us back. It has to be a rudder that guides us into the future. And so some people live in the past, and when they do that, it weighs them down so much that they really can't get anything done for God in the future, and they end up sad and discouraged and defeated. For them, the past is an anchor, and they can't move forward. But I would just challenge you here today, let the past inspire you to go forward for God. Let it inspire you to move forward forward. Not all the sons of the prophets responded correctly to the home going of Elijah. You know why? Because some refused to accept that God took his servant home. Look down in verse number 16 of chapter 2. And they said unto him, that as they come to Elisha, and they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, ye shall not send. Here's a group of men, and they come to Elisha, and they say, you know what? We don't think Elijah's gone, so let's get a search party together, and let's go out and let's look for him. Maybe when he got, went away on that chariot, maybe the Lord deposited him on some mountaintop or on some place. And so let's get a search party. Let's go out and let's look for Elijah. And Elisha said, no, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. In fact, it says in verse 16, um, he said, ye shall not send. And verse 17, and when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. In other words, 
when it says, till he was ashamed, the expression, we could render it like this, until he didn't have the heart to refuse them anymore, or until he was embarrassed. They kept asking and asking, we want to go look, we want to go look. And he said, no, it's not a good idea. Please let us go. Until finally he said, okay, fine, go. You know, go. Good luck with that. That's in the Hebrew. Good luck with that. And they looked, and they looked, and they looked, and they found nothing. There was no, he was gone. There may be some who have the mindset that says, you know, well, Pastor Johnson is gone. We need to go find another Pastor Johnson. Let me save you the trouble. There are no more Pastor Johnsons. There's no more like him. He was a unique servant of God. God doesn't make duplicates. He only makes originals. And so the Lord took him to heaven. And we have to come to grips with that. God was giving the people there someone different. But his work was going to continue on. You know, last April when I was in London, and I was getting ready to speak there at the Westminster Chapel, it wasn't really a happy occasion. It was for my granddaughter's funeral. And I was there at that historic church in London, which is just a block or two away from Buckingham Palace. And this was the historic church that was pastored by Martin Lloyd-Jones. If you don't know that name, many, I think all preachers know that name because he was considered one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. And he pastored that church through World War II all the way up into 1981. He was just considered a legend by, by preachers and Christians. And I was there in that church in the parlor getting ready, and I noticed that in the parlor there, there was his original pulpit that he preached from there at Westminster Chapel, and that was the same parlor he would go to to get ready. And I noticed that in the closet there was his robe was still hanging there that he would, use to, he would put on and he would preach in that robe. And I tried it on, but it didn't fit at all. <laughs> I'm kidding, I didn't try it on. I'm glad I don't have to preach in a robe, by the way. And there was also the pulpit Bible that he used was still there. And uh, I noticed that on the, that pulpit Bible, it was very old. Uh, it was inscribed on the outside. And it was actually given to him by a church here in Baltimore, which I thought was very interesting. And I, I just remembered, I, just, I had a moment there thinking, this is a historic place where a historic person, a, a great man of God, preached. And... Uh, I heard this from his successor. I got, I got to be friends with uh, one of the men that followed Martin Lloyd-Jones there in the ministry, and he, he told me this personally. He said, you know, when Martin Lloyd-Jones finally stepped out of the pulpit, he was no longer there at Westminster Chapel. He said, immediately the next Sunday, 800 people left that church. 800 people left. I would say that that's a wrong response to the removal of one of God's servants. It is the mistake of placing their eyes too much on a man of God and not enough on the God of that man. And so while the sons of the prophets were looking for Elijah, Elisha was looking for Elijah's God, saying, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? So he prepares a successor, he prepares other leaders. He prepares the hearts of the people. And then he prepares his own servants to take them home. And here's another thing I learned about this story. I think there were two ways in which God was preparing the heart of Elijah to take him home in this story. There was, first of all, the route. This, this, I don't have time to give you all the details, but this route was like a victory loop, we could say. Every place was a historic place. Every place represented a victory in the life of Israel and a victory in the life of Elijah. And so it was kind of a victory lap for Elijah. You know, you ever see a runner in the Olympic Games when they win a race? They don't go immediately to the locker room, do they? They take a victory lap all around the stadium. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's exactly what was happening here. This whole route from Gilgal to Jericho to Bethel to Jordan, this was a victory lap. It was God preparing the heart of Elijah to, to call home. You know, some of you might remember 
about two years ago, Pastor Johnson got a serious infection, and he was at St. Agnes Hospital. And uh, it was kind of a very difficult situation at that time. And he called all the staff up there to the room, and all the family was up there. And I anointed him with oil and prayed over him. And, I, you know, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet in the truest sense of the word, but I did feel faith welling up in my heart. And I did say to pastor at that time, pastor, God's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. I, feel, I just didn't get that sense that the Lord was done with him then. And then the Lord left him with us for two more years, which was a blessing for all of us. And I, I don't, if, if nobody else needed it, I personally needed that. I needed that. But I know many other people did. And I think part of that was is that God was actually giving him a victory lap. I think there's a sense in which he could see the fruit of his labor. He could see the things that God was doing. And I think that assured his heart, at least I hope it did, that all the labor that he had done was very valuable labor. None of it was in vain. It was a wonderful thing that God had done in and through his life. And I think the Lord, in his own way, was exalting his servant and preparing his heart. And also, I see here in this story, the river, where there's the parting of the waters. Look down in verse number uh, 7, and it says, And fifty of the sons of the prophets went and stood uh, to view afar off, and the two stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither and that the two went over on dry ground. So here's a miracle that Elijah does right at the end of his ministry. This is an incredible thing because the parting of the waters has only been done two times before this, once with Moses when he parted the Red Sea, once with Joshua at the Jordan, and now Elijah kind of takes that mantle, kind of rolls it up like a towel and snaps it at the water, and the waters part. Just an incredible miracle. God was showing Elijah that he was with him at the end of his ministry just as much as he was at any time in his ministry. And it was a beautiful thing. So how do we respond when God takes his servant? We remember God's preparation. Beloved, we are all hurting today, but you know what? God has prepared us for this. He has been gracious, and he has prepared us for this. He's prepared us to move on. Now, here's the second thing that I learned from the story. We remember God's preparation, but number two, request God's portion. Look at verse number nine. And it came to pass that when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I uh, be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And so there's the request that we see here. This is one reason, I think, why Elisha didn't want to leave Elijah, because it was tradition that a dying man would grant a blessing over his successors or his sons. We see this in the book of Genesis, when Isaac was blessing Jacob and blessing Esau. We see this in many places in the Old Testament. But here, Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And it's a Hebrew idiom. It really just means... I want the firstborn share. I think Elijah considered himself a spiritual son. So he said, I want, I want the firstborn's share of your spirit. And I notice in verse 9, the word spirit is not capitalized. It's small. So I think he's saying, I want a double portion of your spirit. I don't necessarily think he's talking about the Holy Spirit, although it would include the empowerment, I think, that Elijah had. And so he's saying, I just want double of what you have, that spirit that you have. Again, I don't think it's talking about Holy Spirit because God doesn't give the Holy Spirit in parts. He gives us the whole Holy Spirit. The question is not how much of the Spirit do you have. The question is how much of you does the Holy Spirit have. And so um, the Holy Spirit needs to have all of us. But when he says, I want a portion of your spirit, what he's basically saying is, I want that, that spirit you had, that that zealous spirit for God, that spirit that wanted the, that wanted the power of God, that spirit that was courageous, that was bold, that spirit that was just uncompromising, I, that's what I want. That's what I want. And beloved, I can tell you honestly, that's exactly what I want. I look at the life of pastor, I say, give me a double portion of that spirit. 
that spirit of faithfulness to Christ, that evangelistic spirit that wanted everyone to hear the gospel and he wanted people to be saved, that courage of conviction, that inner drive to serve God, that love for people, especially the broken and the hurting. That's the spirit that I want. I want a double portion of that spirit. I want a large portion of that spirit. And you know what? That should be the prayer of all of us here today. God, give us a double portion of that spirit. That way we know the work of God will continue on and see greater days. If we are willing to say that, give me a double portion of that spirit. So that was the, and notice the requirement. Look at verse 10. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So he said, well, you have to be here when I'm gone. And if that happens, and certainly it it did happen, notice the removal in verse 11. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And so there's so much symbolism here. I wish I had the time to go through all of it. But this was God showing that he was God. They, Israel had given over to Baal worship. They called Baal the rider of the clouds. God was showing that he's the real rider of the clouds. And he took his servant away on a chariot. And notice the response in verse 12. And Elijah saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces. This was a sign of great mourning. He's grieving like a son mourns a beloved father. And again, he says, the chariot of God and its horsemen. Again, one man was equivalent to a whole army. And he picks up the mantle, that fallen mantle that was on the ground. And he does what Elijah did. He takes that mantle and he smokes the water. And he says, when he smokes the water, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Look at verse 14. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when when he also had smitten the waters, guess what? They parted hither and thither. And Elijah went over. Incredible. Here's this, this miracle happening again for the fourth time. What does this teach us? The man of God was gone, but the mantle remained. Elijah was gone, but God's power was not gone. God's power is not tied to a particular era. We can have God's power in this era as much as in any time. It's not limited to a particular era, and it's not limited to a certain instrument. The sons of the prophets saw this. Look at verse 15. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest upon Elisha. And they came to him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And so the Spirit of the Lord and God reminded that his power would be with them even though his faithful servant was gone. And friend, that's a lesson that we need to embrace. His faithful servant was taken, but guess what? We we still have God's power with us. We worship the God that our founding pastor worship. We trust him the way he taught us to trust him. Now, let me give you the third thing quickly, and we have to close. So how do we respond? We remember God's preparation. And number two, we request God's portion. But here's number three. We recognize God's purpose. And what we need to realize is that, and this is what the prophets realized, that God's hand was now with Elijah, but in a different way. God was going to do different things. You know, Elijah's, actually the names of these two men even convey that. Elijah, his name means El is God, I, my God is Yah, Yah, uh, Yahweh. And he was a prophet that was raised up to confront the false worship of Baal. This, when Israel was given over to Baal worship, there was a prophet who with courage and boldness stood up against all the currents of the time and said, my God is Yahweh. That was his ministry. But Elisha... That name means, my God is salvation. And Elijah's ministry, you'll notice, was more about deliverance. 
He did miracles too, but it was with a different purpose. They were miracles of healing. They were miracles of deliverance. What's the first miracle that Elijah did? Calling down fire from heaven. What's the first miracle that Elisha did? Healing the waters. You could say that their ministry was as different as fire and water. It was just different. God was still with them, but God had something different in mind for him. God has an overarching plan, and he gives duties to his servants to fulfill that plan. And so what I would ask you to say today is, Lord, what am I to do? How can I fulfill your plan? What is your purpose for me? Elisha couldn't be Elijah. God had a different purpose. And the same is true of all of us. But get involved. Do something. Help us as we move forward for God. I'll just close with this. I was reading about Harry Truman. He was an unknown senator from Missouri. Kind of came from out of nowhere to be Roosevelt's running mate. And he was vice president when the election was won. On April 12, 1945, after being vice president for only a few months, he received a phone call that said, come to the White House quickly. And so he rushed to the White House thinking the president has some special task for me. But when he got there, he was ushered into Mrs. Roosevelt's room, and she said to him, Harry, the president died. And Harry was stunned. He was silent. And after a few minutes, he said to Mrs. Roosevelt, is there anything I can do for you? And she said, no, Harry, is there anything I can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. (laughs) Because that was a very difficult time in our country in the middle of World War II. And he felt a huge burden on him at that time. You may feel that way a little bit today. But just remember this. When God's leader is removed, everything of God remains. Everything of God remains. God's uh, God's man is gone, but the mantle is still here. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is he? He's in the same place he's always been. You know what I want to ask you? Where are the Elijahs of the Lord God? Where are the Elishas of the Lord God? Are there any people here willing to say, give me a double portion of that spirit? Give me a double portion. Let's bow for prayer. And so, Lord, that is our prayer. You have blessed this church in so many ways. And Lord, you've given us a faithful man of God to lead us all these years. And now, Lord, that you've taken him, we have to to come to grips with that. We have to understand that you have a purpose and a plan. And we have to remember that you prepared us for this. You've been very gracious in the way you've dealt with us. And we thank you for that. And may we have the same spirit that our founding pastor had. May we pray like Elisha prayed. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? May we have the same request that he had. I want a double portion of that spirit. May we recognize that, Lord, the power is still here, and you have a a purpose for us to move forward, and that we're poised by your grace to do great things for your namesake. May we take confidence in that. And may you comfort and bless your people here today. And we pray in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. Amen.